Hey, I'm Shauna, just a human from Los Angeles here to help you pick up the pieces from your breakup. I'm so excited today to have Melody Amadine with me. She's a mental health counselor and coach specializing in the field of trauma recovery. Her YouTube channel focuses on helping people find freedom from their suffering in dysfunctional relationships, in particular with people who are personality disordered. Hey, Melanie, thank you so much for coming on with me today. Hi, Shana. It's lovely <laughs> to be chatting with you today. We've been talking about this, and I'm excited to be here talking about these subjects with you. I was hoping that today, if it's okay with you, that we could start by talking about trauma bonding. Absolutely fine. So uh, I'm a trauma counselor. I've been working in the field for over 12 years now, helping people recover from traumatizing relationships. and one thing that people keep asking me is about trauma bonding and this is something that is very apparent in dysfunctional abusive relationships the trauma of being like elevated and appreciated idealized to then just being discarded to being devalued to being accused to being blamed all of that is quite over time quite torturous can be a form of torture and then as such a form of emotional stockholm syndrome happens where we end up bonding more with our accuser and is it also a function of because lower lows are going to lead to higher highs that it's almost like we emotionally become dependent on their moods for our stability and we like a drug like we're like oh i hope when they come home when i come home today they're going to be in a good mood right or it, so is it just do we, is it say to masochism? Do we enjoy abuse or what do you think it is that causes this, this Stockholm syndrome, this, this trauma bond with somebody who in our minds, we know is not good for us? Well, a form of codependency happens in an unhealthy way. What you just described there could be described as becoming dependent upon that person being in a better mood again in order to feel better that's the thing it's very unnerving to say the least and torturous and abusive to say the worst when someone will just flip at you it's it's traumatizing to your nervous system to be walking on eggshells around someone when they can just flip out and for a lot of people who have bpd oh they God. struggle with um regulating the intensity of their feelings and can be very, can easily flip. And not just people with BPD, but just traumatized people, for example, who slip into an emotional flashback and then can just flip again. And that is very shocking and startling for the other person. So over time, um, it does make sense in, in a very sad way, but you do want to stick around to feel better, for the other person to feel better so that you can go to a state of relaxing again. But that doesn't really last for long, though. That's the thing. So, is, is it like a fight or flight type of a reaction? I mean, is does it come back to our like sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous systems, or is it just it is what it is? Is it mental? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Like, where where do you think that this like bonding occurs primarily? I'd say all levels. Yeah, I mean, it's a fawning response, isn't it? Want to uh, to placate, to fawn, to make it better for the other person. And it temporarily soothes both people. But if it keeps happening, then it's just the cycle that keeps happening. We end up enabling them and they don't really change. And the trauma of everything that happens just keeps you in your own little bubble. There's other things that happen just with isolation from other people and not getting a reality check from other people and then just buying into this co-created fantasy that you've created. And that I think also intensifies in the trauma bond. So even the very concept of a bond, right? When I'm thinking of bonding, I'm thinking of like crazy glue at this point. <laughs> like, you know, when you're trying to break up with someone or you're in the in the process of, of breaking up or you have that broken heart, the bond feels, it feels tangible right? Like there's an actual cord that is plugged into your heart and into their heart, even if they're a million miles away. So, so 
so how do we break this bond? I mean, right? That's the holy grail, right? How how do we how do we break this bond? How do we move on from this feeling of emotional and mental attachment, particularly to something that is so unhealthy for someone? I and by the way, the reason I say something or someone is one thing that has helped me in my recovery is separating the person from the relationship. Right. So the relationship is the something and the acts is the someone. And is the trauma bond to both? Is it to one or the other? Like, is it to the person? Is it to the relationship? Is it both? Both. And uh, it's, there's lots of explanations. Um, and, and I'd also like to say with trauma bonding, often it's what bonds people in the first place is a shared trauma. So often people who can relate. And they find, like, finally, I met someone who can get me. And say, people who like to dive in and you really click, then it's easy to get really, really close to someone quite quickly who is personality disordered, especially if you share similar traumatic stories from the past. So, having that wonderful experience of finally meeting someone with whom you can connect with to then have experience like that person treat you in such a harsh way um that is right there like the instigator for the trauma bond and so that is goes to your past that brings up stuff from the past and that's held in the body as well is it not and so that's what i'm saying it affects us on all levels really so to move on from this to heal from the trauma bond is to see, see things as they really are. Giving yourself a reality check to come out of denial is the big first step. And that's, in my opinion, the first step of moving on. Right. Um, so, <laughs> right. So, so what, boy, that denial piece is so big. It's so big because even... I can tell you personally, even in the moving on process, like there is that little part of me that's like, what if he calls and he's all better and he's working on himself? And it's like, even when my like internal messaging is, oh yes, I've moved on there, that element of, den is it, is it denial? Is it false hope? Is it like, like, what is it that's like, oh, well, you know, it, it, the text is going to come, the phone is going to ring, the, even if I know I don't want this, there's still that niggling feeling of like, maybe it's coming back. Oh, it's Pandora's box, isn't it? Like when the box was opened, what remained was hope. And that's it. It's hope, hope that maybe it could be them coming back and maybe there could be reconciliation. Maybe it could go back to how it was. And that's normal, it really is. Thing is, is attachment to that story means that we can get lost in the illusion that it can create. And that is false hope and wishful thinking. And then we end up just harming ourselves by prolonging our suffering, being attached to this. So how do you think you could define denial versus hope? Being patient with yourself, giving yourself time to not be overthinking about this and giving yourself permission to have fun. I think a lot of people struggle with moving on because of guilt, of confusion, the pain. Um, really, if you wanna get clear on what's real and what's fantasy is to, in my opinion, restore your nervous system and get calm and create an environment in which you can find peace, then you're more likely to calm down your nervous system because you're going to be in fight or flight you're going to be triggered there's gonna it's it's inevitable coming out of this kind of relationship so the more that you can soothe and calm down and relax the more likely then you can see things for as they are because you'll be in a more stable and safer place to do so right so i guess so would you say do you think that somebody with a personality disorder is necessarily like creating these bonds on purpose or is it just in their nature and it it's just because their behavior patterns tend to you know go in a particular direction they tend to have a particular result but it's not necessarily deliberate i guess like there there's this like dichotomy of like 
do I hold them accountable for their actions because they're hurtful or traumatic? Or do I say it's beyond their control and it's really something that I should sympathize with or empathize with? And like, like where is that balance? I mean, because mental health is health, right? So, so I guess like, one of the cognitive dissonances is not judging, but acting upon a certain action because it hurts me, but it I know it's the mental illness speaking, as opposed to like, what if they had cancer and they were so demanding of me and it was stressing me out and I couldn't function and I'm sick over it and it's still having these detrimental effects on me. It's still out of their control. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, where do we decide that to, to nurture somebody with mental illness versus self-preservation and sort of walk away from them. I could argue that it's both that you can love someone from afar by walking away because yes, it's good to be sympathetic and to realize that when people are largely unconscious, meaning that they don't have a grip over their mental health issues, they are a slave to their own whims, impulses, and urges, then yes, they don't have control, but however, to tolerate their behavior then enables them. And really it's an act of growing up that needs to happen. And I would argue then it's, is it not an act of love then to let them fall on their own sword and to let them grow up if you've been helping them all this time and they haven't grown up still? Wow. <laughs> that that's so interesting because what that brings up is um so falling on their own sword so for so many people going through a breakup their biggest worry is like i don't want to be with this person but i don't want them to be with somebody else and if they fall on their own sword it's like oh then they're going to be better so do I want them to be better for me or better for somebody else? Because I could go, oh, for somebody else, because they're never really going to be better. Well, then what am I worried about? Or if they're better for someone else, well, why can't they be better for me? Right? So again, like it's like this, this, these mental patterns that as the, as the trauma bonded person, there's just so much dichotomy. There's so much you know, it, it, it's a, it's it's not a, a line, a continuum. It's a circle, and it's like, where does it end? We get we get stuck in the circle game, right? On so many different treadmills. Well, exactly. So this is why, actually, I think being judgmental in the form of discernment is important and breaks you out of that circle because there needs to be a point in which you judge: is this person actually changing? Because I think anyone can change, but the more someone is, the more unstable that person is, the more unconscious they go, the harder it is for them to sustain long lasting change. Like they can change, but it's gonna be harder, it's gonna be slower. So you do need to make a judgment call. But then the difference is with discernment is to be able to let go of that attachment. That is to not care if they're particularly gonna be worse or happier, you wish them well and that's that. And you can let go of that story. So, so for me, I think like my personal problem is as a, as a yoga teacher and my life is so ingrained in this practice that I have really learned to, or trained myself not to feel anger, right. And in, in to let go of resentment. But what happens is I don't feel it up here, right. So it winds up getting pushed down and it winds up in here. So I don't, I don't feel like I have negative emotions towards, let's say, my ex in this situation. And so when it comes to like the trauma bond, right, I think that there's a, like a question of if you are already in that process of letting go of resentment, of letting go of anger or whatever, the dangerous other end of that continuum 
right is idealization, right? That, well, there was nothing really wrong and, and he's okay. And, you know, there's nothing that bad about the behaviors. And, and so wherein that seems like the kind response to me, like, I don't think it's the healthy response. Right. And I think that there's there's somewhere in between of letting go of resentment and honestly, idealization. Um, And and by the way, unless you're stalking them in social media, you don't even know if they're improving themselves unless you're in conversation with them, in contact with them, which I think is dangerous. I think it's it's hard to break a trauma bond and stay in contact with with your ex. Think about the intensity of being in a relationship with someone personality disordered, okay? And when it was really good and all the energy and drive to get back to that good state to merge again, because when you have beautiful moments, when you're enmeshed with your partner, when you merge, it's, um, it's a wonderful feeling that a lot of us are unconsciously trying to get back to. So... Having time apart, in my opinion, with little to no contact if possible, really does help with your mind because your mind will be automatically wanting to think about them, be dreaming about them maybe. Emotionally, you're pining for them because it's it's addictive. That's the thing. The nature of these relationships get very addictive. So how would you treat an addiction, really? So what about like the pain of a healthy breakup versus the pain of a toxic breakup? I mean... It's funny when I look back on my breakup, maybe I'm just not remembering correctly, but it seems like I got over my healthy relationships a lot faster and more easily than this like really, really unhealthy one. And and I do want to say that there's so much talk about patterns. I don't, I don't know that everybody has relationship patterns. I mean, this relationship, I've never experienced anything like this and I'm 51 years old now. God help me. Um, so, you know, I, I, I haven't seen this pat. In fact, I've never seen these behaviors. I mean, I've seen little elements of the behaviors now that I'm looking into it with other men. Um, but I like this one is just like, wow, like, like I've had such better relate, like such better relationships. Does that mean there's something wrong with me? Like, why, why is it so much harder, codependence, to get over um, a difficult relationship, a toxic relationship? And I like to say relationship because I don't think 99% of people are toxic. I think it's just how we interact with them that create toxicity. Um, but it's just, it's just been weird for me because it's like, yeah, I've gotten over some really, really, really wonderful and incredible men, like so much easier. I quite, <laughs> you know what? I think <laughs> in healthier relationships and more neurotypical relationships, however you want to see it, more functional relationships, right. there's more healthy independence. And there is a healthy measure of codependence, which is normal, natural, you're a team, right? The thing is, is that in dysfunctional personality disordered relationship, you end up relying on each other. So you're like balancing against each other. And this is like unhealthy codependence. And um, and the trauma bond keeps you even further like this, even more dependent on each other. So when one person leaves, you're going to topple. So based on that, I mean, it makes sense then why it's harder to move on from these kind of relationships. That's a really cool analogy. Even just putting your arms like that, like really clarified things a lot. Um, okay, great. I, I also... I guess that, I mean, there's also, right, we've got resentment, which is in the past and fear that's in the future. And um, does a trauma bond always rely on the past? Is it, is it always about um, the relationship that happened? Or could a trauma bond also be attached to the fears of, well, how does my future look without all these promises of the relationship that I was in? I mean, is that a whole nother ball of wax is is this this future fear versus this like connection to an unhealthy relationship in the past i i swear i've read a study on like caged animals when they spent so much time in cages you open the door and they don't want to leave that's right right but i don't know is that a fear of the future or is that an attachment to the past or does the attachment to the past feed into a fear of the future yeah exactly 
it's all happening at once. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot this week about like the word stuck, right? We talk about being stuck and um, I've always thought about like stuck is sort of hard to move on. But then I'm realizing like in order to be stuck, you, you have to have forces pushing from both sides, right? So there's mm -hmm. that past that keeps pressing against you. And there, there's this future that's scaring the hell out of you. And then there you are just, just stuck in the middle. <laughs> Conflicting forces and energies within. What yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah, it, 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 it's so confounding, really, the, the human mind. And, and I think that um, when you get involved with someone, particularly in my case with, with a borderline, um, you start almost wondering, like, who, like, who's the one really with the problem? Why am I so stuck? Right? Like, it, it's just like you become sort of the, you know, the bearer of the weight that you know, maybe they've put on you, but it's like, wow, like it, it really sheds a light on your own weaknesses and your own sort of unhealthy aspects of self, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's such a wake up call to see how we act in challenging situations that we may not have realized interacting with more stable people, you know, um, and just in general, our adversaries can be our greatest teachers. And for me, this is what helps moving on, just finding meaning out of this, really. Let's say that you're trauma bonded to an emotionally abusive person and, and you're really committed to self-growth. I mean, you you really do want to learn the lessons. And, and quite frankly, I believe it's the only healthy way to move on. Um, the low-hanging fruit, of course, is I enabled this. I stuck around longer than I should have, and therefore, I subjected myself to this, right? I mean, I, I can't say that this is, none of this is my fault because I should have walked away. However, I also feel like that's maybe sometimes a bit of a cop-out, right? Because it's like, how do you find your role in a relentlessly abusive situation where you're just a shell of yourself beyond, I was a shell of myself? Right. Like what, how do you like find your contribution to an abusive relationship without literally abusing yourself by taking on responsibility that you shouldn't be taking on? Yeah. So how do you grow other than saying, I won't enable again in the future, like something or maybe not. I mean, with a borderline personality, it could be that there was nothing that you did, you know, because it could be as simple as saying, you know, the water's boiled and everything boils over. I mean, did you did you contribute to that? I don't know. Do you? Yeah. So so that's like also the weird like you want to grow You're you want to be better from this experience beyond just like I don't want to get into that situation again. So so how do you find like a rational like explanation of your role in a truly and relentlessly abusive situation? Mm -hmm. This is why I think it's imperative to find an environment in which you feel safe in which you can calm down and self-regulate your nervous system because then you can access your mind properly when you are in a relationship, when you are sharing an environment with personality disorder partner or ex, like I have clients who are going through a divorce, but they're still sharing personal space with them. Right. And it's hard to fully relax because you're on guard, you're protecting yourself. But anyway, the thing is, if you're still sharing space or if you're still in a relationship with someone who keeps blaming you of course it's going to be really hard to discern what's yours and what's theirs it's a very lonely relationship in which your reality is being denied by your more dominant partner who is like um maybe there's some bullying that happens in which you think okay maybe it really is me and um even more of a reason why I think it's good to get space for you to think, what is my role here? Is it really all me, like they're saying? And in that space, not only can you 
get a better chance of having more clarity, but it also shows you from the response of your partner how they truly are. If they're having a serious reaction to you leaving and are bullying you, pestering you, guilt tripping you, playing mind games with you, even more of a confirmation that you've done the right thing to leave, to have space from them. Right. So I think sometimes like, you know, like your rational mind knows, like I did the right thing. So, so how do we, how would you suggest that someone stay in their rational mind versus their emotions? Because I think we all know that our emotions can be way stronger than our brains. You know, our brains aren't stupid. And you could also say that your intuition also knows, right? Which I might argue is an extension of your emotion rather than your rational mind, right? Intuition is just like, so both your intuition and your rational mind are like, run, don't walk. But your heart is like, don't go. Like, how do, how do we walk away and like, like literally just, just keep walking, that is so that is truth by the way right there it's like your heart saying stay but literally everything else is saying go and yeah again this is the trauma bond right here it's like the bonding to this person who's creating all this this situation end of the day you are co-creator into this story as well you two have created this story and in my opinion the best way is to make a decision and to stick with it because a lot of people stay because of the fog, you know, fear, obligation, guilt. They'll stay because they love this person so much. And how much of this is wishful thinking? How much of this is denial? Because ultimately you're so dependent upon this person, you can't imagine a future without them. Um, believing maybe everything they're saying and you don't want to leave because you're believing all the negative judgments about you. There's so many dynamics that can keep us tied to someone like this and in my experience the best thing to do is make a decision and to stick with it and to hold on to it it's interesting that you say you love them so much because i wonder if love is even the operative word right yeah (laughs) because i um I don't, I I think it's more, again, like loving the idea or loving the past or loving the future or the future that isn't even the future is just your, your expectations of the future. Um, So yeah, I think love is tricky. Um, I was at a meeting the other day and somebody made such an important, like an interesting question. They said, well, where is the line and it's going to sound so like silly and like, like not even on the same plane, but then when you think about it between love and pity and it's like, boy, like, do you want to love someone for whom you have pity? Like, do, is that the relationship you want to be in? You just want to be with someone because you're better than they are, or you can heal them or you can fix them. Um, You feel bad for them. Like, do you, like, is that love? Do I love the everyone for whom I feel bad or feel pity is such a, like a difficult word, but isn't that interesting when you stop to think about it? Absolutely. And I mean, love is just so nuanced, isn't it? Compassion, pity, sympathy, it's all acts of love. And is this the kind of love that you want to be focusing on in this relationship? Um, because when, it, when it's like pity that keeps you together, it seems like it's more like a carer relationship or a parent-child relationship. And surely, I mean, I would want an equal. Right. Yeah. I mean, they say we all marry our mothers or our fathers, but I don't think we really uh, need to or or our children, I guess. Um Yeah. So, okay. So for me, like, I think that when you say just make a decision and go with it, it's super important to take it just, just moment by moment, like even day by day in the beginning is just too much is too much, but it's like right now in this moment, can I survive? Hopefully the answer is yes. I think, you know, 99 billion out of 900 billion at one time, the answer is going to be yes. In this moment, in this second, I can do this, right? But it becomes really overwhelming when you think 
so big and so broad, like never, or if you're in some no contact rule, like three months or whatever, if you have it set in your mind that on this date, I could contact them. Well, pfft, boy, that's not going to accomplish anything. You're just, you're just waiting for, you know, a date to arrive. And instead of healing, you're just like stagnating until that day. And you're like, oh my God, now I can write to them again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's attachment to our stories that we create and our emotions fuel this so it's understandable longing missing them especially when you spend so much time with them to suddenly to be ripped apart from you it's shocking it's traumatizing so part of my counseling services that I offer is often we're thinking about things that we wish we could have said to get closure to answer questions and I try my best to help with that but ultimately it's at some point making peace with and accepting that things are the way they are and to be patient with yourself it takes time for denial to fade away and to see things as they are, you know? Yeah. And closure, again, just such a loaded word. Can you have not no contact and closure? Because that way, the only closure you can really get is within your own heart, right? Because because you're not talking to them. All you can do is, is hope that they receive good vibes or, you know, um, but sometimes it's, Sometimes I think that people lie to themselves themselves. And, and I think we all have when they're like, all I need is closure. It's like, no, you don't need closure. You just want to talk to them again. <laughs> You're not gonna be like, okay, now I'm better. You know, now that I told you X, Y, and Z, I have closure, you know. Well, it's also, yeah, you're right. It's closure within ourselves because even if you were to get a disordered X in front of us, and even if they were to just be in the right mood to listen and not interrupt and actually take on board what you're saying would they give you the really the reaction that you need right now and even if they did it's probably just be temporary would it actually give you what you need you can give yourself what you need and that is forgiving yourself and it is the gift of truth and clarity and seeing yourself and loving yourself to like create a better life for yourself just my philosophy how do you think you forgive yourself if let's say you behaved in a way that was beneath you like you know that you're not that person but you you got provoked or or maybe you didn't even get provoked maybe you just behaved in a way that was shameful I mean how do how do you forgive yourself if you're like a truly introspective human being um you know it's funny so so um in Judaism right they say that um God will forgive you for sins against God if you ask forgiveness automatically but only a human being can forgive you for sins against a human being. And in that, I hear, um, I, I can't, I can't forgive. If I hurt you, I can't just be like, oh, well, whatever. She forgives me. Right. Like that's not enough. I need to make my direct amends with you and give you the chance to forgive. And then I would say, if you can't forgive at that point, I need to forgive myself. But if you're no contact or if contact is unhealthy for one or both of you, um, yeah, I mean, how how could I possibly ask somebody other than in my heart um, for forgiveness without, without contacting them? <laughs> Well, it's, you're doing this for yourself, really. So right. for me, forgiveness works when it goes hand in hand with applying action to make atonement, to make reparations, but not necessarily with that person, especially if they're out of your life. It's what did I do that that I can take accountability for that contributed to this? And what can I do differently next time in future interactions? Because we're always interacting with people. We always have relationships with people. What we've learned, what we've seen in our shadow, I guess, interacting with dysfunctional people, you know, it, we can apply all these lessons to every future interactions, not just with that person. To so then have, commit to again, commit to be more awake, you know, in the sense more conscious living in that you're more self-aware of how you're acting. That shame has then served its purpose. You are now acting, this is growing up, isn't it, really? And then we can let yeah. go. And then this is how forgiveness needs to go hand in hand with action. 
Well, even in a healthy, I, I use the term healthy because I don't know if anybody's healthy, but even in a healthy individual, right? Breaking, breaking a behavioral pattern, pattern is, it's darn near impossible. You know, you can, you can learn the lessons, but then you got to apply the lessons, right? I mean, how many times have I gone in my past into a final exam, knowing everything, and then you get to the exam and you're like, I don't remember anything. Like I, I can't even write anything down. And, and I find that's like a very similar analogy to like a situation will present itself and you're like, well, I know how I need to behave. Um, and, and even in a healthy mind, that's hard. So can you speak or touch upon like in, let, let's talk about BPD, okay, in a borderline uh, mind, because we, we had touched upon this privately, about just literally how does the brain function or not function in a dysregulated mind? I mean, basically, um, there are going to be physiological reasons for behavior, and then there's going to be psychological reasons for behavior, right? Or, or, or just like nervous reactions for behavior, rational actions for behavior or reasons for behavior. Um, but I guess, so from what I understand, the amygdala is overstimulated and the frontal lobe is understimulated. So there's literally yep. synapses that are overfiring, under firing and what is the possibility of those like synapses or whatever you would call them so not a scientist um being reprogrammed in a way where they could ever literally be something different than what they've always been because you know if i have a computer that's programmed to do math. And all of a sudden I want to do artificial intelligence for language. It's not programmed for that. It simply is just going to spit out numbers. Um, I'm a fan of Dr. Daniel Siegel, his book, Mind Maps. He talks about how we can change our brain. I mean, we know the brain is plastic, neuroplasticity. There's a lot of research on that. Um, but with self-awareness and this is why mindfulness and meditation practice are key in healing with time what this does that uh, daniel siegel talks about is this changes the brain structure and actually improves the bonds between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala so meaning that even though and it's showing people with bpd through brain uh, brain scans that the prefrontal cortex isn't getting activated as it should and this regulates impulsivity um gives us a reality check through practicing mindfulness and just taking steps to pause and check in with yourself what is happening catching yourself observing yourself this changes your brain and in time makes it easier in time for you to then give yourself a reality check so people who can relate to this you can actually improve but it's fighting the urge to want to be impulsive and not do it that's the thing is getting into a habit the regular practice of self-awareness. So do you think that meditation, breathing, yoga um, are like the best pathways to increase neuroplasticity or like, could it be if you are a runner and that's how you get in the zone or a painter or a writer? So, so how would you say is the best way to increase neuroplasticity um, to, to reprogram your brain? All of the above and then some. Like I'm a fan of like I personally make extracts from mushrooms that I forage. So I've got this wonderful like chicken of the woods extract, which is just loaded with like antioxidants, for example. I take that and instantly I'm like, it's those pure jing. And I'm in this, I, I'm just woken up, I'm present. Same with foraging, the act of foraging is a practice of mindfulness. Same with dancing, meditating. Well, meditating is harder because I have to sit there and I can't run away. I'm forced to like pay attention to my thoughts. And in that respect, it's the most important to help you discern what, what kind of thoughts you have, what's an impulse, what's intuition, what's fear, what's anxiety. But any, in my opinion, any act in which you are present, like watch, washing the dishes and just being present to the action and being out of your head and not thinking so much, that is key. And I think that's the most important thing to practice getting out of your head and just being and observing. Okay. So you would probably say that if somebody is looking to heal from a breakup, 
just being present because the breakup happened in the past. Right. And so again, it, it's, it's our connection to the past and our fear of the future, um, which is literally, I mean, absolutely literally not being present um, that really inhibits our healing more than anything. Yeah. Well, in so many ways it does. Like, listen, at the beginning, especially at the early stages of a breakup, just to shock the pain, it helps us to like, and this is why yoga I find actually really helpful. So your videos are wonderful because it encourages people to come back into our bodies, you know, right. to be right. in our bodies again. And this is, it, come, it helps us come out of our minds and feel grounded and safe, you know, and right. that's important. Um what about- what about people who can't get out of their minds? I mean, the, the thing about like just replacing a thought with a new thought, I think <laughs> is really hard for a lot of people who don't have like a mindfulness practice, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, a lot of times I know with me, like I'm really good at quieting my mind because it's my thing, um, but I can't seem to quiet my body. Right. Like, so if if you believe in chakras, right, like my heart chakra, my throat chakra, this is where I always feel my stuck um, energy. And it comes in the form of actual pain in my heart. Like it feels like somebody is just (laughs) stabbing me and nausea. Right. These are because these are my imbalances or whatever. So I think that if you connected me to an EKG, like my brain would be, or whatever it is that does brain waves, my brain would be like this, but my body is like going like this. So it's like, yeah, they, I mean, how do we deal with like physiological responses? And like more specifically, um, so many eating disorders come out of um, breakups, right? Some people are emotional eaters and some people are emotional starvers. Either way, that's that's not healthy you know, do you, you know, do you just eat what you want to eat when you want to eat it? Do you, you know, go to comfort food? Do you, you know, like, how do we get past the, like the physiological reactions, even if we are able to control our mind? So I, <laughs> well, I, going back to what you said just before that, there is something that anyone can do if you find it hard to come back to your body and that's just a stop and drop stop what you're doing drop into your breath and into your body just taking a deep breath when we do that we detach from our thought and even though it's just for a brief moment that's reprieve right there that you can take and just to observe what's going on what's happening right now and that's it that's like 10 seconds of a mindfulness practice right there right we do the easier it is to do it and I think in a recovering from a breakup, it helps you give yourself a reality check. So if you spend too much time maybe rom- romanticizing the past to be able to then, is this what I wanna do? How is this serving me? To ask yourself, how is this serving me? Is a wonderful way to help you snap out of it and ultimately helps you heal. Right, because the answer is it's not. Mm. Okay. Exactly. So with what you're saying with your body and the physiological responses, I mean, I'm not trained in that area, but I, I would argue it's a meditational practice just to pay attention to what your body's saying. And if maybe you do want to eat foods that is high in sugar and fat, then you do it. And then actually, yeah, that was emotional eating, you know, just, okay, well, there we go. That's emotional eating. Maybe I won't try that next time. It's okay to make right. mistakes, providing you're willing to learn from it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because we are so programmed as humans to be afraid of imperfection. Right. And it's like to date since the billions of years since Earth was created or or whatever, whatever you want to call it, conscious man, there's yet to be a perfect human. Like it's very unlikely it's going to be me, you or anybody else who is on Earth. And yet it's so hard for us to swallow that pill of wait. I can't, I, I, I can't be imperfect. There can't be something wrong with me. Um, but you really have to be willing to look at your, um, uh, your shadows, your, your darker side. Um, in fact, I, could we talk briefly about shadow work and how, and, and why don't you, Melanie, tell people um, how they contact you um, 
for services and what kinds of work you do with them and, and maybe what they could expect from working with you or what types of um, clients you most enjoy working with. Well, I like doing shadow work, actually, as part of my work. So that's a good segue into it. I'm a mental health counsellor and I've been working in the field of trauma recovery for over 12 years now. And um, now that I'm specialising in helping people leaving dysfunctional relationships, um, it's um, the attachments to the stories that get created in these relationships and what comes up and stuff from the past confounding what's happening in the here and now means that it's such a confusing painful time and I help people make sense of it and um, the shadow work as I say is seeing what's come up that you don't like about yourself in this relationship maybe you've been blamed for it um, attacked for it maybe even maybe this has brought up stuff from the past in which you were judged and it's it feels horrible right to do shadow work is to own that part, to come into a better loving relationship because anything bad about us can ultimately help us in the right context. For example, laziness, all right? Sometimes it helps to be lazy because uh, we finally get a chance to rest, you know? <laughs> but then the flip side of laziness is, you know, inertia and not getting anything done. So even times when you're being selfish, to be selfish can be very good at times, all right? And very bad at times as well so to move beyond good and bad you know I mean there are times when certain things are useful and when we can get into a better relationship and understand how it served us in the past to be selfish to be lazy etc and then it's better than to make it work for you and not work against you when we can own that part of us and ultimately it's liberating because then no one can have power over you by accusing you of this part you know because you're like yeah I know I am that, and I've I've made that conscious decision, and and ultimately, I guess that's what it's all about is the conscious decisions that we make, not just from day to day, but again, really from moment to moment to be, you know, hopefully uh, the best people that we can be, however that manifests. Um, and I think that when we can reside in that, we also um, can be more comfortable being alone right? We, they, when we realize that we don't really need somebody else to complete us, I think about the book, The Missing Piece by uh, Shel Silverstein. You know, I'm looking for my missing piece. Do you know that book? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. No. Oh, it's such a great book, but uh, it, it's, it's like a, a circle and it's missing like a piece of, like a pie piece say but um the truth is that it can still roll it doesn't roll like with the most efficiency but it can still roll and, and we're all going to have broken pieces um and it would be lovely to find that person that makes us feel more complete but ultimately we I think can never be okay with ourselves unless we feel complete with ourselves and that's our our light side and and our dark side right because it, we are all and unfortunately you know as humans a composite of of all of it in psychosynthesis which is what i trained in, in my counseling it's synthesizing the aspects of our psyche that perhaps we split off suppressed projected been in denial of and integrating at a higher level so in this sense we are achieving completion within ourselves by through self-awareness through shining a light that is conscious awareness into the shadow that is your unconscious and and taking back aspects of yourself that you haven't seen that you've projected onto other people both the good and the dark and um yeah this the beauty and wonder of seeing truth in yourself it's the best gift in my opinion right and i think that also a distinction that has to be made is between contentment and complacency so contentment being i'm okay with who i am as i am and yet i will always strive to be better complacency is i'm exactly where i need to be it's all good and i think that that's like a very uncomfortable place i think it's where most people who are self-confident reside unfortunately um, wherein they don't feel like there's any, um, not even room for, need for growth. And I will argue that even Mother Teresa, 
um, was always trying to grow, I'm sure. I mean, I didn't know her personally or anything, but, uh, you know, even the Dalai Lama, even these, these just highest, you know, um, most enlightened humans, I think, are the ones who realize like you, if you think you've arrived, that's your first sign that you haven't arrived because you haven't arrived as long as you've got a pulse, there's room to grow. Of course, we are not sterile beings for as long as we're living, we're growing. Melanie, I can't thank you enough for um, coming on with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure that so many people are going to learn and grow so much from, from listening to you and also going to your channel and playing your playlist over and over and over like certain people have. It's really been helpful. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful talking with you. Easy to talk with. And um, yeah, I'd like to do it again sometime. Absolutely. I look forward to it.